let's just look at the double standards. If you are burning churches or you're blocking railways, but you're doing it for a progressive cause, then that's okay. Mm -hmm. But if you are a trucker convoy protesting vaccine mandates, well, that is beyond acceptable civilized behavior and you must be crushed. Hello and welcome to Freedom Feature. I'm your host, Barry Bussey. With me today, I have law professor Bruce Party, who's also the executive director of Rights Probe. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the domination of progressive thought in our institutions. Welcome, Bruce. Thanks, Barry. Thanks for having me. I, I hope I introduced you right there. You're the CEO, right, of Rights Pro? Well, the executive director. Cool, executive cool, cool, cool. director. Thank okay. You, yeah. Well, listen, uh, great to have you aboard again as we talk about this concept of progressivism that seems to be, I, I refer to it uh, in some ways, or at least uh, growing up in Newfoundland, I remember very clearly standing, watching out in the water, this big, massive fog bank. And it would slowly be inching its way to the shore. And then eventually it comes to shore and then creeps upon all of the houses. And and pretty, pretty soon you can't see hardly uh, five feet, 10 feet in front of you. And, um, and it's kind of like progressivism has kind of taken over society. And that's the picture that comes to my mind. But but help us out here. You, you've written some pieces recently on some of these themes. And I'm just wondering if we can open up this whole discussion. So let me start maybe with the bottom line. And the bottom line, I think, for me is this. Today, the way things have evolved, it's as though being progressive is to be neutral mm. and to not be progressive is to be wrong. I mean, that's where we've gotten to. And the ascendance of this ideology, and that's what it is, it's an ideology, mm -hmm. is such that we've lost sight of the fact that it is an ideology. And as an ideology, it's, it's, it's one of the competing versions of things. But when an ideology becomes ascendant in the way that this one has, it's like nothing else is, is legitimate. Yeah, like even just to help our... Um our viewers to think about the concept of ideology. I remember back in the day taking a course on ideology in political science. But but as I understand it now, it's been, been a while since I've really looked up a definition of an ideology, but it's it's basically you've got a, a a narrative that explains the whole world and may have part truth. And sure. and it seems that the way it operates is that uh no matter what happens, in other words, it, you, you can't even see reality anymore. Everything is through that ideological lens. And even when it, it doesn't make sense, it's explained in ideological terms. Am I, what's your sense of it? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, not, an ideology is really just a worldview. And it does mm -hmm. act as a lens sometimes. I mean... I've heard psychologists suggest that we're all doing this in some respects. I mean, the, right. the world that we imagine is maybe not the objective reality that we think that it is. The way we think of ourselves, our self-image is at least partly sort of made up so that we can carry on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so this is all, you know, a, a, a matter for, uh, for the psychologists to determine. I don't really know, but it makes yeah. some sense to me that yeah. we would all sort of see the world through a particular lens that has premises embedded in it and that we would understand what's happening only with respect in, in, in reference to those premises. So, yeah, I mean, in a sense, everybody has a worldview, even if they haven't articulated it yet. And also, of course, you know, all governments have a, an ideology of some kind, mm -hmm. even the ones that claim to be pragmatic. I mean, pragmatism is itself an ideology. Right. So you, you, you can't really get away from at least having some ideological influences in, in the world of governance and politics. But I guess the problem comes is that when we got a asymmetrical kind of alignment of one particular ideology that is forcing everyone to accept, which is what I think we are. And like you say, progressive thought now is that if you don't accept it, you're wrong. <laughs> it's somehow right. neutral, right? It's yes, yes. Well, so let's just take a step back for a moment and just define our terms, right. uh, because okay, so progressivism, progressive 
woke, liberal. These are among the terms that have been used to describe the, the, the ascendant ideology that we now have. And of course, those terms don't reflect their meaning because right. you know, progressive has nothing to do with progress now. Mm. Being woke doesn't mean you're awake. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't mean that you're aware of stuff. Right. And liberal does not mean liberal. It has nothing to do with what liberal actually used to mean in the English sense. Right. So they're all labels for a collection of premises, sometimes in some respects interchangeable, those words. And we can go through what those premises are. But that has become the dominant worldview. And if you do not adhere to that worldview, the idea is that it's not just that you have a different opinion, it's that you are you are wrong. You've, you've got to be wrong because you don't agree. And that, that leads us to a very interesting phenomenon that's happening now, which is the, the existence of the double standard. And right. anybody, I think, who's paying attention can see the double standards that are occurring all over the place in our governments, in our laws, and, and so on, with respect to speech, with respect to conduct, with respect to guns. Let's start with the guns, right? So mm -hmm. right now, Justin Trudeau has... Uh, it's coming down hard on legal gun owners, making it more difficult all the time to purchase, to hold, to possess a firearm. Based on stories that happen not in this country, but happen in the United States. Well, not, but not even based on those stories. I mean, yes, that's the excuse. Yeah, that's it's, the excuse. That's just an excuse. So here's the double standard, though. Trudeau is making it more difficult for the legal, authorized, registered, licensed gun owners to own a gun. At right. the same time, at exactly the same time, that his government has introduced a bill in parliament to eliminate minimum sentences for gun crimes. Now, if you really thought that guns writ large were dangerous and gun crimes were the ultimate wrong, then you wouldn't be eliminating minimum sentences. You would be doubling down on them. But that's not what's happening. This is, a, this is, a, this is an example of a double standard. So what's happening here, this is repressive tolerance. This is what the, the label that, this goes back to... Uh, the critical theorists, right? Okay. Repressive tolerance is the idea that I'm going to quote you. This is this is from James Lindsay. James Lindsay is very good at all of this. Yes, yes, yes. Right? He uh, summarizes repressive tolerance this way. He says movements from the left must be extended tolerance, even when they are violent, while movements from the right must not be tolerated, including suppressing them by violence. In other words. What you've got here is an explicit agenda to treat different ideologies different ways. If you are coming from the left, then you must be tolerated, you must be encouraged, you must be supported, even if those movements tend to include violence. Whereas, if you are coming from the right, you must be crushed. And it doesn't matter if they what, you, what you're talking about is conduct or speech or whatever it is, you are not with the program. And therefore, what must be extended to you is intolerance. Now, some people have a great deal of difficulty accepting that because it is so contrary to what we have, at least people of our age, have been grown up to think of as standard behavior, standard mm -hmm. expectation. That's now the era we're entering into, an era of repressive tolerance where the standards for conduct and speech are different depending upon whether you are adhering to a progressive agenda or not. So therefore, it's okay for the group that you support to destroy police cars, smash windows, burn, all of that kind of thing. But if you're, if you're with exactly. a different group and there's none of that going on, but you got to smack those guys down as hard as you can. Right. So let's, let's just, let's just look at the double standards in the yeah. context that you're speaking of. So if you are burning churches or you're blocking railways, but you're doing it for a progressive cause, then that's okay. Mm -hmm. But if you are a trucker convoy protesting vaccine mandates, well, that is beyond acceptable civilized behavior, and you must be crushed. Okay, That's what we mean by a double standard. You can find these double standards strewn throughout now our uh, laws, our uh, the actions of our governments and our, our police forces and, and, and so on. So, so I, I was reading uh, some articles recently about this whole thing about the gun thing here in Canada, and yep. one of the arguments that were being made was that the only reason that came up was to be kind of like a stick in the eye to the conservatives because they know full well the conservatives will vote against any kind of, I mean, we already have a very strict 
gun legislation apparatus here in this country, sure. but knowing full well that the other side is going to be against it, there is this kind of like, you know, we're going to jab you to just to see if you say, ouch, and um, and then use that as as a political rhetorical means of saying, look, you know, you need to keep supporting us. Sure. Well, you can see this as, a, as, as merely a partisan strategy, and there's probably some truth to that in mm. exactly the way that you describe as sort of an immediate uh, way to curry favor with your base and mm-hmm. to get those people who don't vote for you anyway all riled up. Sure. But there's also a, a, a deeper correspondence here <clears throat> to the themes we're talking about, which is that your crackdown is against those people who will not go along with the program. I mean, it, it just happens mm-hmm. to be, I think, the, the, I, I think the understanding is that a large proportion of gun owners are not only conservative voters, but are rural, white, self-reliant, more traditional people who probably are the ones also that are not terribly woke. Right. And therefore, they're fair game. Their lives should be imposed upon because their lives are wrong. Hmm. That, that that's sort of the blunt way of putting it. And the people who are committing gun crimes in the urban areas, members of gangs and so on, those are not those people. Right. And so that's why we want to change the sentencing to uh, make life easier for them when if they get caught. That's exactly right. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, proof is in the pudding, as they say, but it would strike to me that for the long-term viability of even our civilization, this kind of mindset is one that's fraught with all kinds of long-term consequences that are going to really challenge our ability to be able to continue as a free society, it seems to me. Oh, there's no question. I think you can, I think you can see those cracks happening already, easily so. But but long-termism is not something that our governing ruling class has been very good at for a very, very long time. I don't think the writing on the wall that you are seeing is going to deter any of this because it's just not within the mindset that they're using. I don't, I don't think that would occur to them to worry about. It's kind of like when the Titanic hit the Berg, you had people who were convinced that she was still unsinkable, but they were still saying it was unsinkable even as it was sinking. Yes. Well, so this is, this is a big danger. Actually, I'm not talking just about the woke now, but there is a big danger in the population at large that may believe, to to go back to your analogy, that this country, this society, this economy is unsinkable Mm. because it has been good for so long. Right. It's been good for their whole lives. Even those people who are getting to be older now, Mm -hmm. frankly, our economy, our society has been prosperous for their whole lives. Right. And it seems like the natural order of things. Mm-hmm. It seems inevitable. It seems like a God-given right, right that we will have a country and an economy that provides us with a certain degree of prosperity. It just mm-hmm. has always been that way. Why wouldn't it continue to be? And of course, that's not true at all. We have what we have, I think, through a combination of historical accidents and good luck and hard work of our ancestors and a, and a few organizing principles. And those organizing principles are, are, are now very much in question. They're being, mm-hmm. they're being taken down. And the question is whether or not we will be able to maintain this kind of prosperity in the longer term without those principles. And I think it's very possible the answer will be no. In some ways, if we are students of history at all, we see these kinds of cycles, right, where people uh, take everything for granted and are not willing to be disciplined as their forebearers were in in making life possible. I think of my grandmother who came of age in the um, late 20s of the previous century. And um, so she went through the 30s and it, it was fascinating seeing her as older. I mean, you didn't just throw out a piece of aluminum tinfoil. Right, you right, wiped right. it off. Right. You know, and and you kept it. Even as a young child, I would be visiting my grandparents and they still had the outhouse. You know, that kind of uh, that kind of thing. They now they raised eight children who all did very well in life as far as workers and, and raised families and all the rest. But what was fascinating to me, she did not even trust the banks because mm-hmm. the banks in her experience were not trustworthy. And so she was like the queen, wherever she went, she had her purse because everything she had was in her purse. 
And, um, you know, the purse could not be out of her sight kind of thing. You know, I didn't realize that until after she passed away and some family members shared that with me. But, but I mean, there is a disconnect between me and my experience and her and her experience. But who's to say we will not have that same kind of thing? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think that's a real possibility. It won't be the same, of course, but it no. will be some other kind of hardship that comes about, frankly, in large part because of a very long record of mismanagement and, yeah. and, and bad principles in the way that we are governed. You can see things starting to come apart now in terms of inflation. And we all know what the situation is with gas prices and food prices yeah. and housing yeah. and, and, and so on. But this is largely, at least at my take is, this is largely a crisis of, of our own making. Exactly. Uh, a succession of governments have, mm. have just strangled the ability of people to make their own way. Mm. And to innovate and to to transact, troubling too much new money into the economy so that the value of the dollar goes down, strangling supply chains, strangling regulation, all, all of the ways in which the, the nanny state has interfered with the people's ability to make their own way uh, is coming coming maybe coming home to roost yeah i think so and and you know it's fascinating we we are really an amazingly rich country with amazing resources and yet because of an ideological position are not able to access those resources it's kind of like literally we are our own downfall we the decisions that we have made or i.e the leaders have made for us are our own downfall and yet they still cannot see it because even though the ship is sinking it wasn't an iceberg, you know, it was something else. So, right. so, so now let's, right. let's have a look at, at, at this progressive thought as it, as it continues to dominate in our society. And we think of our institutions, Yes, it, you know, we've got it in academia, we've got it in the legal, you, you've, uh, written a piece, uh, uh, just recently. Have, have we laid the foundation enough here now to move on I, or do you I think, think so? Something? Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's carry okay. On. So the piece that you wrote with respect to just as, Wegner's comments on the Freedom Convoy. Mm -hmm. um, just, just, just unpack that for us a little bit. As you know, what, what we what we have, I mean, there are so many very basic principles in our legal system, or at least there are thought to mm -hmm. be, and principles that we thought were very well established. And one of those is the idea of the impartiality of courts. Uh, you know, you'll be familiar with this very well established saying that justice should not only be done, but should manifestly and undoubtedly be seen to be done. That's right. Yes. Right. Yep. And you know, that, that principle has been accepted for, for decades in various places, including at our own Supreme court and including at our own Canadian justice council. And Really, I don't think there's anything controversial about it. But the problem that arises in this particular situation is that our Chief Justice of the Supreme Court gave an interview with the, the, uh, Le Devoir that was published on uh, April the 9th. And in that interview, the, the according to the article in any event, the Chief Justice condemned the trucker convoy that was in Ottawa protesting vaccine mandates. And said some things that suggested that he had an opinion and a position on the protests and on what might have been an appropriate way to combat it. And that struck me and some others as problematic in the sense that it showed a lack of impartiality on the case that is now going to be heard. There are at least four different challenges to the invocation of the Emergencies Act by the federal government. Right. Uh, the, the issues that will arise in that case were very close and relevant to the observations that the Chief Justice was making, which raises the question about whether or not, if and when any of those cases reach the Supreme Court, and they could very easily do so, whether or not the court will be truly, genuinely impartial in that case, or whether or not the, the Chief Justice's expressions of opinion will have first reflect his own inclinations before the case is heard, mm -hmm. and whether or not they will have influence on how the other justices, both at the Supreme Court and in the lower courts, approach the case. And so it seems to me to be a very simple proposition that when you have a court that is determined to be impartial, that 
the justices on that court should refrain from from commenting on cases that are likely to come before it. And of course, as you mentioned, I, I remember back in 2018, when the Chief Justice did his first press conference, he made reference to the fact that Canada is, or at least the Supreme Court of Canada is a very progressive court, and he took great pride in that. Yes, um, yes. So he, got, he got a question from a reporter at this <laughs> conference. The reporter, if I remember correctly, asked him if he would agree that the, the Supreme Court of Canada was the most progressive Supreme Court in the world. And the, the Toronto Star reported that Wagner so I agreed with that with pride, that mm. in fact it was such a progressive court with a leadership role to play in, in promoting moral values, which presumably he meant progressive moral values. But this sort of reflects on what we were saying earlier, which is we're now in danger of coming to the point of accepting that being progressive is being neutral and not being progressive is to be wrong. Whereas in order for a court to be genuinely neutral in a pluralistic society, one would have thought that it would have to be neutral before the moment of ideology instead of after. Right. In other words, if a court says, well, we're, we're on that team and we're going to be neutral about it, well, that's a contradiction. We can't be both. <laughs> yeah. And people who are not progressive, I think, would justifiably think, well, this is not neutral adjudication. Right. You, you've already indicated how you're inclined. If it were on the other foot, if Chief Justice had made a comment about how much he supported the rights of the truckers to express their view as all citizens or something along those lines. Well, uh, let's, let's just exactly so. Let's just let's just make this explicit. Let's yeah. say let's say the Chief Justice had, number one, declared the convoy to be courageous, declared the mandates to be illegitimate, and suggested that the invocation of the Emergencies Act was an outrageous violation of civil liberties. Mm -hmm. If that is what he had said, then I think the federal government would justifiably perceive that he had prejudged the case. I would say that all of the so-called progressive newspapers in the country, the Toronto Stars, would end up calling for his impeachment, wanting right. him brought before Parliament. Uh, you know, it would be it would it would be quite the show. Sure, exactly. It's exactly it's exactly right. But see, this is this is the way in which our modern institutions are all essentially aligned, yeah. right? They 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 they're, they're all progressive, and yeah. so when the media, if if the media were to hear that, then they would react just as you're describing. But because it's on the other foot, it all sounds fine. Yeah. Because yeah. again, what is considered reasonable now. Is has been narrowed to the spectrum of progressive ideals. And it's not that there's only one progressive reality or truth. I mean, right. progressivism, people who are progressive differ between themselves in a range, but it's a very narrow range. Right. And so we're in danger now of, of basically defining reasonable to correspond with that narrow progressive range of things. When you're impartial, now, if you claim to be impartial, what you might mean is, you have an open mind to all reasonable perspectives. Mm. But of course, only progressive perspectives are reasonable. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, do you remember the, uh, there's a term in politics, uh, what's it, the something window? You're referring to the Overton window? The right. Overton window, that's it. Right. Yeah, so it's kind of like that, right? Like, like, so now we've got, okay, so reasonable used to be this, but now we have shifted it so that reasonable is only that which is progressive. And as long as you stay within there, then, uh, you know, you're in the Overton uh, window of reasonableness. As right, well. right. And so let's just acknowledge what progressivism has come to mean in the, yeah. in the modern era, right? This is the ideology of collectivism, of equity, of wokeness, as I referred to earlier, of safetyism, as we saw reflected in this COVID response, and right. the, the ideology that embraces both the necessity and the reality of the managerial state. All right. So if you're okay with all of those things, well, then you're on firm footing and you're reasonable and everything's okay. But mm -hmm. if you dispute the validity of those things, if you say, for example, as I do, that the managerial state is a detriment in total to the lives of citizens, right. then you're not on the right page mm -hmm. and you're not likely to get a, a, a neutral hearing on that proposition. And so then that, that, that becomes a real problem as we look at the various litigants who are coming before the courts. 
and are having a having to try to make their case. I, I've often referred to, for example, I, I did a lot of work in the area of religious freedom over the years, and um, mm-hmm. I used the phrase, a legal revolution against the accommodation of religion. And w- what I meant by that and what I mean by it is the idea that there used to be this basic understanding that the law would be very permissible towards religion, allowing religious practices and so forth, and it would accommodate it to a fairly high degree. We saw that even on controversial issues such as the marriage reference case and dealing with same-sex marriage and where there was an accommodation made for clergy, for example, uh, Mm -hmm. who had religious views that were such that, no, it's the traditional marriage, one man, one woman. And so the court made an allowance and said, yeah, well, in this country, we make allowances for individuals of religious communities. And so they may be outside of what the elite would advocate, but we we make allowances for for these differences. As time has gone on, it seems to me that what we've got now is a more narrowing so that by the time you come to the the Trinity Western case, you've got this total fixation with with no, we can't even allow this school to have this this new degree that it wants to to have, which is the law degree. Well, because they have such unacceptable, non progressive views with respect to marriage, and 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 that's just one example. But but it seems but like the best one. It's the best example. It's the yeah. apex of what we're talking about. I think it's a very good case to refer to. Right. So you've got a religious school who wants to open a law school, who believes in a certain version of marriage, which is religious in origin. In a former era, people probably wouldn't have even blinked. Yeah. But the Supreme Court, in dealing with this, did exactly as you say, which is to say, I'm sorry, there's no there's no room for this. Yeah. Even there's though no the, law, the law there's to that, that point was more than gracious or accommodating. Right. One thing I always want to point out when, when we're talking about the Trinity Western case is this. The Trinity Western case, unlike the way it's portrayed sometimes, was not a contest between competing charter rights. Right. Right. right? There were not two sides, one with equality rights and one with religious freedom, because there was only the school involved against the regulator. And so the only charter rights in question in the case were the religious freedoms of the school and its its participants. And so what the court said is that even though only religious freedom is involved in this case, the regulator is entitled to crush them as long as they're doing so in the name of charter values, which what they meant by that was equity, which makes the, the charter freedom of religious freedom um, you know, in, in that kind of a context, basically useless. Yeah, useless. Because Non-existent. The, regular, the regulators got licensed now to basically, in the name of progressive causes, to subdue what those freedoms might have otherwise meant. So we see this domination of progressivism also in basically every every administrative decision made by the executive. You know, over the bureaucracies is. Thomas uh, Sowell famously quipped, to understand bureaucracy is to understand that they care nothing about outcome but procedure, right? I mean, it's it's the procedure, making sure you followed all of the guidelines and that the government well, yes, issues. Yes and no. I mean, I love Thomas Sowell, but but <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure that that the process isn't designed to achieve a certain result, even if they don't say so. Right, right. Um, True enough. I, I guess the thing, maybe what he was referring to, and I haven't read that comment in context, but it could be uh, that even though, for example, a student who is not vaccinated is going right. to lose maybe their educational career, that yes. outcome doesn't really bother the bureaucrat as long as the procedure was followed, I think. Well, right. That is absolutely true. But but here, again, here's the underlying layer. I, I've said in the past that COVID is a perfect progressive storm. And all of these progressive rules and restrictions and mandates are, in a sense, it's pinnacle achievement to this moment. So the idea that a student in a university who has thought for themselves and said, well, I'm not going to get vaccinated, right? but I want to carry out my education. I mean, that's not progressive thinking because you're supposed to sacrifice yourself for the collective. 
Right. And you're supposed to do as you're told. You're supposed to believe in the authority of our experts. And right. therefore, we're going to have rules which require you to get vaccinated. And if you don't, to leave. And we don't really care about the outcome, but we do. We're quite happy with the outcome that expels people like you mm. out of our institution. Right. Because you're obviously not behaving with the program. Right. Yeah. And, and, and there's that, that form of demonization that goes on to the non-progressive, right? Yes. Now, it, bear, it bears saying, I'm afraid. So let's go back to the courts for a minute. Yes. The courts are not monolithic. I am not suggesting that every judge on every court thinks this way. That is not true. We have judges who have very different and competing judicial philosophies about how to approach the interpretation of statutes and so on. So we're not talking about a monolithic institution. Right. But more and more, it appears to be the case that our governments are monolithic in a very broad sense, even those of different political stripes, whether or not they're you know, liberal or conservative or NDP, even the conservatives during the COVID era, during this COVID era that we're not yet out of, have behaved like progressives. Mm. I mean, two of the two of the most dictatorial uh, provincial governments have been Ontario and Alberta. Right. I mean, there are others, of course, and there's there's no distinct difference between the way they've approached these problems compared to the way the other provincial governments have have, have approached them. Right. Um, so there's there's really not very much for my money in the partisan differences as it relates to this essential phenomenon that we're talking about. Mm. Conservative governments are not not progressive. Right. They do have come on board with this set of premises and maybe on occasion dissents here and there. But for the most part, that's just not the case. Again, it's this asymmetrical alignment, right? So that you've got... Yeah. Even the prime minister who appoints the judges because he wants to make sure that those judges are going to be progressive as as he is. Well, yes, but let's, let me just stop you there. Just let's just yeah. let's just be clear about this. So, okay. sure, Trudeau right now, prime minister has the ability to appoint judges, but prime ministers of all political stripes have been appointing progressive judges to the courts for years. True. I mean, the, many of the judges, many, not all of them. But many of the judges that uh, Stephen Harper appointed right. to courts across the country are progressive judges. So again, this is not a partisan thing. This is a this is a much broader phenomenon, as we've been saying. You you raise a good point there because uh, one of the things that a lot of conservatives have told me over the years with respect to Stephen Harper's appointment of judges is that the the legal profession itself is hugely progressive right we, we saw sure. that yes um, and so therefore the it may very well be that the the crop to choose from is such that you've already by almost uh, like i mean th th there is this process that we go through through law school through articling and all the rest that kind of indoctrinates us into what has now 50 yeah. 60 years ago would have been a very conservative profession but now has become extremely progressive well you might you might make a case to trace this to the law schools certainly as it has been right. expressed in the reflected in the legal profession maybe it started there in the sense that the the the, the range of acceptable thought may have begun in the legal academy a place where what is considered reasonable has been narrowed to progressive ideals alone. I mean, there are, there are very few, very, very few law profs, certainly in this country, who would publicly criticize progressivism as a system of legal thought. And and if they do, it's, uh, it's a career-ending move, or at least uh, one where... If you've uh, reached a certain area in your career, then that's as about as far as you're going to get, right? Because you've got the <laughs> wrong views. Academics in general, for, for for a profession that has the kind of job protections that it enjoys, mm. as a profession, academics are remarkably conformist. Yes. And, and anxious to be approved of. And so the number of rebels that you'll find are, are maybe smaller than one might expect. Right, right.
this current prime minister, anyhow, certainly progressive, who's going to be, uh, I noticed the language, for example, discussions in the, in the national newspapers, in the legal community that are talking about the new appointment that the prime minister is going to make because of Justice Moldaver, who's going to be retiring in a number of months. And already there is this admission in the, this one article I read about the importance of ensuring progressive alignment or some words to that effect, which I suppose you would expect because the prime minister is progressive. But again, you don't see much criticism of that. Whereas when Harper was in the seat of power, there was all kinds of criticism that Dream Court of Canada was going to be the United States Supreme Court of the North. And it's not even close. Right. So, I mean, again, we put this bluntly. The progressive expectation might be expressed this way. Any judge to be appointed by a conservative government must be neutral. But of course, any judge to be appointed by a progressive government must be progressive. Right. right, and right. This, yeah. this this is the this is the non symmetrical state that we're in. Yeah, to to appoint a an expressly conservative judge or or otherwise, I mean, conservative is not the only alternative, but let's say conservative to appoint an expressly conservative judge, I think would be regarded as an outrageous thing to do. Mm. An outrageous thing to do would be attacked in the media, would be condemned by you know the the uh, opposition parties and and by all good people, mm. but the proposition that you would be be appointing a progressive judge to a progressive court would be well of course <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah it's uh it's just absolutely fascinating where we are in this country so you got the academy you got the judiciary you got yeah. the politicians today now we've yeah. also got the media and and the media itself right. now is is coming under fire with the prime minister's work on the uh, C11 C18 which sure. uh, has to do with in part controlling what's going to be on the internet but right. also controlling who's going to be media who's who's going to get the charitable status for media now well right so so yeah so the argument there is the media is bought off and you know that could well be so with with the funding that's happening but i'm not even sure that the problem doesn't predate that whether or not that was the case anyway because this right. is a, this is a situation where all our institutions basically have been taken yeah. by this prevailing ideology it includes the media for sure for sure and whether or not that would stop if the the funding stopped i highly doubt it right uh, but it also includes the other parts of government yes even regardless of who happens to be in power at any particular moment right this, right. this is the, the deep state problem that the people in government the officers the departments the agencies and so on are themselves woke Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't really matter if it's Harper or Trudeau in power, because right. the agencies will carry on the way they are determined to do. They will not put up with, this is the irony, will not put up with so-called political interference. Okay, So in that respect, now we're even anti-democratic in the yeah. degree to which the progressive flag has been planted and buried into the inner workings of our government. It would be wrong. It'd be simply wrong to say, look, this problem relates to the government of the day, the prime minister of the day. You know, that's right. the problem. Change right. that and everything gets fixed. That is just not true. That's an excellent point because we've already got it established now in the institutions of government. So for those who are non-progressive, as defined by the woke crowd, I, I've got a literally as a result of the uh, last couple of years in this country with the whole vaccine mandates issue, the um, the increased power of government. I've got a number of uh, acquaintances that I know that have literally packed up their bags, sold their houses, yeah. lock, stock, and barrel, and have now yeah. moved south or even yeah. further south than just the United States yeah. um, to Costa Rica, to Belize, to other countries. And I'm like, I I mean, are are we in a situation where there's this kind of ideological purge going on? In in a sense, yes. I think these people have concluded that there's really no place for them in this country. Mm. And I I can't say that they're wrong. Because the the level, going going back to this idea of repressive tolerance, this is not just an abstract theory. This, This is, you can see it happening, where the people of a particular bent are simply not going to be tolerated it's not gotten to such an extreme yet that it's it's like literally dangerous in the physical sense but who knows where this is going i mean who knows 
And so I can totally understand the people who, who have concluded that this country has changed to such a degree that there's really no place for them here. It's quite fascinating. Uh, like, I mean, even the admission of a recognition that, okay, right now it's not physical, but who's to say, right? I mean, and, and, and the reason why, why that would even be plausible is because we've seen this story before. Like people think, oh, you know, right. we are, well, we yeah. are so advanced of previous generations and all the rest. But the reality is, is that this is exactly what happens. When we have demon and literally demonize people, you know, mm -hmm. sure. as as the prime minister has done for those who are unvaccinated. Well, see, this is this is a good point, though. So let me challenge myself about yeah. it being not physical. Now, I meant not physical in a certain way, but the vaccine mandates are a physical thing, right? They, they basically are a a a challenge to your right to bodily autonomy. Right. No question about that. So, and and that crosses a physical line in the sense, not, not in the, in the, in the traditionally violent sense, but in the right. sense saying, you no, know, you will do this in the physical sense, or you will suffer consequences. And Work, I got to feed the family or I've, I've sure. got to travel to see the family. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm doing it, but I'm, I'm not doing it because I, I think it's correct, you know, and, and that has been something that's been said to me over and over. But, you know, we're entering, it seems to me, a very, it's kind of like the twilight zone, right? I mean, it's a very strange time where we get this domination of this progressive thought. I, I was speaking with a professor who wrote The American Awakening, Josh Mitchell at Georgetown University in Washington. Yeah. He was going on about how, you know, in many ways, it's it's kind of like a, a spiritual thing. <laughs> like there's a, there is this almost religious-like mindset that has taken over, you know, and I, I mean, I, I, this is not his words, but I'm, I'm going to use the word. It's almost cultish. You know, it's, it's like, if you're not in, you're out. And by the way, we're not going to hire you. Sure. Sure. Well, pe pe various people have made the argument that wokeism is essentially a religion. Mm. I mean, it, it may not be a religion about God, but it has the features of a religion in the sense that it has a code that you have to believe. And if you don't believe you're a heretic. But, but but it's not sufficiently a religion or acknowledged to be one such that you, you're able to make the claim that there should be a separation between church and state and, and you know separate the woke from from the from the from the levers of government right and so we have government that is essentially religious in that secular sense in terms of its insistence that the that the code of belief is the one that you must adhere to so it, it does act like a religion in that sense especially in the sense of wanting to throw out the non-believers and mm. when you've got a state apparatus a, a a managerial state that controls everything mm. now if that state wants to throw you aside then you're in a lot of trouble you know it's interesting i was reading solzhenitsyn in fact i'm finding myself reading him more uh right now <laughs> yeah it's that how he's becoming more relevant all the time uh, i you know it's it's kind of like i i saw someone uh, and uh, as is orwell uh you know yes, the, yes, the yeah. t-shirt which says make 1984 fiction again you know <laughs> that's right <laughs> it's just, right, right. right. Um, but what he points out is how people in Russia were watching as their neighbors were being arrested in the middle of the night or, you know, arrested in very strange circumstances and suddenly di disappear. And, and everyone is like, you know, there's almost kind of like this surreal moment where it's like, OK, well, that's them, but that's not us. It's they're, they're not going to come and take us because, you know, we haven't done anything wrong. And then he says it continues so much that even when they're arrested, they figure, OK, well, you know, once we get down to the station or get to wherever, you know, they'll straighten it out. They'll know that I didn't do anything wrong, you know, and it's no problem. Right. And then when they're, you know, sent to the gulag, it's like, you know, I just don't get it. You know, it just right. makes no sense as right. to why I'm here. Right. Exactly so. And that is one of our biggest problems. It is our disbelief. It's our naive disbelief that they don't really mean this. And this is a bit, a bit of a mistake. If we, in other words, if we simply understood each other better, or if we respected each other more, then we could resolve this. That is naive. That is not the program that's being 
expressly described. And so if you take things at face value, you don't even have to look very far. If you look, mm. if you look at the writings of the critical theorists that are now being reflected in all everywhere. I mean, in the curriculum in public schools, in you know, in the curriculum at universities, in the way the media now writes, it's everywhere. And so you have to prevent yourself from saying, well, they don't really mean that. Yes, they do. They do really mean that. You know, therefore, govern yourself accordingly. Yeah. And and some of the things that um, what we see, just let's just highlight what they mean or what the conse- potential consequences are here. And I think they're very real consequences. And then let's talk about for just a wee little bit while we have a little bit of time is the idea of what should we be doing? Some of the consequences I see, and you can help me here on this, but one I see is this consistent purging that's going on in government, corporations, educational institutions, and also dealing with the civil society, i.e. charities. You know, if charities do not have the correct view of the world, then they shouldn't have charitable status. The fact is, is that we've already experienced where young people who refuse to accept the ongoing narrative are losing out on their careers or the careers are are being disrupted in a big way. I wrote a piece on this uh, recent decision out of the Ontario Divisional Court on the vaccine mandates dealing with students and the absolute lack of empathy towards those students, but the absolute almost praise of how efficient McMaster University was and and all the rest of it by the court just kind of gives you just oodles of mindset as to where the judiciary is on these issues. So we got the loss of jobs. We got the loss of position as far as appointment in a- academia. We got the media that is constantly, you know, sounding out the government's spiel on things. We've got government itself making life extremely difficult for people. And I use the vaccine mandate thing, but it's, uh, you know, the uh, for air travel and that kind of thing. There's a wee little bit of pushback coming right now, but we'll see how far they get with that. So yep. those are the kinds of things. Now I wonder, okay, so how far does this ideology go? In Russia, we saw in the past that if you didn't have the right ideas, you could own property. Mm-hmm. I mean... Is that out of the realm of possibility? Like, I mean, I, I mean, th- those are just so, some of the ideas I've been thinking. Well, it's hard to say, of course. Uh, no. I don't know, but, but, I mean, the, the vaccine mandate is a very, is a very, is a very telling uh, event yeah. in the sense that it does sort of parallel your example of of, of political correctness in Russia, right? So, if you mm. if you don't agree to have the vaccine, then you're not allowed to have a job. I mean, that's not literally in every workplace, but it's been a, the case in a lot of workplaces. And, and you can't travel and so on, as you say. Uh, so that's 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 coming pretty close to the same thing, especially because of the degree to which that we know that the vaccine mandate is not based upon any real consideration of the public health factors and the, and the so-called science involved. I mean, that's been totally thrown out the window. So we know that it is essentially at its at its core a political thing. And if as a as a result of a political mandate you are not allowed to have a job, then that is going down the road that you're describing. Mm-hmm. And how far we're going to go? Who knows? This is very bleak and for those of you who are watching I'm sure you're thinking it's bleak. Yeah. Um or you may think we're totally crazy because we're not progressive, but <laughs> <laughs> right. But right. the the we're, other we're, we're unreasonable for that reason. We're unreasonable, right? We, we're we outside the Overton window there. We're right. of what's acceptable. Okay, so what do we do? Well, so the, the I think that one of the biggest, one of the best cracks for optimism is this, that in this COVID area, there's been a lot of overreach. Like they've just gone too far too fast. And an awful lot of people are thinking, you know, what what the heck? And the more people that think that, the more it's possible that we will get a critical mass of people who decide that this is actually not what we signed up for. And so, you know, in a in a perverse kind of way, the more extreme things got and the more extreme things still will might get, it might be in the longer term the better, because more people will start to say, look, I'm not I'm not getting a fifth shot. 
you said two, then you said three, then you said four, and I'm not getting the fifth one. I'm just not doing it. And if that happens across the board, then then suddenly the thing loses its momentum and people start to question. We need people to question the things that are taken as given. And the more moments that come about that cause people to do that, the better. So it's it, it's it's not a hopeless situation the reality yeah okay so so ju- just the having the ability to question being willing to stand out and and it may mean in um a short term or a relatively longer short term as it were or like a, a medium term that you have a a time where you are without employment because you've made a stand you know and uh, i'm afraid so we said but so we got all kinds of bad things coming down the pipes though right you got you've got people who are without jobs for that reason and you've also got this happening at a time where as we referred to uh, at the beginning you know you got the increases in food prices and gas prices yes. inflation across the board it may be again that more and more people as they experience real difficulties in carrying on with their lives it may occur to them to think, well, you know, who's been minding the store? What? Well, why are we in the state? We are supposed to be a rich country. We have all kinds of resources. We mm-hmm. have all kinds of gas in the ground, petroleum, and yet gas costs three bucks at the pump. I mean, what mm-hmm. what is happening here? I can't afford to drive to work, and I um, mean, I would I would never want that us to get to that place. We're pretty close to it right now already. But one of the effects of getting to that place might be that more people just. Have, get to the point of having had enough of this intrusive uh, state apparatus telling people what to do to their detriment Mm. and managing things so that life becomes more difficult for them instead of less. Well, anyhow, it's, uh, you know, the, the optimistic side is it's time for people to wake up and uh, to just say, Hey, enough's enough. Let's just hope that, that is indeed the case, but I think it's extremely important for people to have one's head out of the sand so you can see what exactly is coming upon us. Any other closing thoughts that you'd like to share with us? I, I think that's pretty good for one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, Bruce, it's uh, always a privilege to have you and uh, to talk about these things. And uh, we'll have to do it again in a couple of months, another roundup to see how, how things have fared. And uh, hopefully we'll see by then some people who will say, look, guys, we've had enough. Hey, thanks, Barry. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Freedom Feature. And uh, it's been a great opportunity to be able to share some of our thoughts uh, as to what's been happening with this domination of progressivism uh, that we see in our culture. But as we talked about, it's not going to be up to you to stand up and to speak out as to what is happening and uh, to hold those in authority accountable. And so, as we've also mentioned many times that on this feature, We are wanting to have open, transparent dialogue. You may not agree with the positions or the opinions that are expressed on this program, but that's okay. That's what this program is about, is to help you to think and not to be part of the group think. So until next time, I'm Barry Bussey. The fight for freedom consists not only in the legal battles in court, but also in the battle of ideas at the universities and in the media. It takes time, effort, and money to keep on top of the debates for freedom. Your donation allows us to keep fighting for all Canadians. Firstfreedoms.ca